Okay, our next speaker is Jesse Lopez from the Oregon Health and Science University. Um, his field is environmental science and engineering and he's studying with Antonio Baptista. He did his practicum at Oregon National Laboratory and he'll be speaking about sediment dynamics in an energetic estuary. All right, so um, the estuary that I study is the Columbia River Estuary. And just to give you a sense of where this is located, I have a map over here of the Pacific Northwest. And the Columbia River uh, drains this huge uh, basin out here. And all of that water comes down and exits out into the Pacific here. And the estuary is located uh, right in the heart of Cascadia, um, right between. So here's Portland. Here's Seattle, so it's right here. Now the Columbia is a massive river, well massive uh, even amongst all of the rivers in the, in the world. It's the second largest river by discharge in the continental United States, and it's the largest source of fresh water for the Northeast Pacific. Uh, now this, all of this energy in the coming down uh, town the river has been harnessed um, by hydroelectric dams. So the, over the past 150 years, nearly 300 dams have been uh, built in the Snake River, Columbia River system. Um, so humans have fundamentally changed the circulation and the dynamics of the system because they've fundamentally changed the hydrograph. In addition to changes to the hydrograph, um, you notice here that there's big shipping containers that move up the river. So the system has been channelized through the creation of jetties and levees and dredging so that the flows are much faster than they were naturally. So you have this enormous amount of water coming through these basically artificial channels, so you get a very energetic environment. Despite these changes and the decimation that these changes have had on the fish species here, the estuary still remains a very important um, nursery habitat and migratory pathway for federally protected uh, salmonid species, which are really the heart of the ecosystem for this estuary and for the broader northeast uh, Pacific region. The fish that come through here end up going off of the coast of Alaska and are caught there by fishermen. So there's an, the, the estuary itself is important commercially and uh, in terms of the environment. Now, I belong to an organization and our goal is to better characterize the physics and biogeochemistry of the estuary. And one of the ways we do this is by using this thing called the Saturn Observatory. And what the Saturn Observatory is is a network of sensors that collect data 24 hours a day throughout the, the entire estuary. So here I have a map of a bunch of these sensors out here. So most of the uh, sensor network consists of these permanent stations that are located throughout here and they, they're collecting uh, data on physical variables as well as biogeochemical data. So we have these long time series uh, collecting data. But if you notice, there, a lot of these stations are, are located uh, right along the edge and on the main channels, and that's because these stations require electricity. There's, uh, we don't have good enough batteries or solar panels to power these up, so they have to, we're kind of biased in where we're able to sample in the estuary. So one of the ways we, we help with that is that we go out and we also have these mobile platforms which consist of research vessels and AUVs which are um, essentially underwater drones, so they operate in the estuary and they're just autonomous and they're collecting data. And we have sea gliders that operate out on the coast and they, they operate in a similar fashion. Um, so despite this pretty dense instrumentation we have in the estuary, and the Columbia is in fact one of the most densely instrumented uh, estuaries in the world, there's still a lot of gaps due to the bias in, in the data that we collect. Um, so one of the ways that we fill in these gaps in the data is that we use models. So here I'm showing the same map that I showed before, but this time I've overlaid it with the computational domain that I use for my studies. And what I do is we, I solve for the hydrodynamics and sediment dynamics of this system. If you notice, the domain is quite large. It starts up here off of Vancouver Island in British Columbia and it moves south to Northern California. But most of the, the uh, mesh resolution is focused here in the estuary. And the reason our domain is so big is that there are important coastal processes and circulation patterns that intrude into the estuary. And getting these uh, circulation features are a first order problem for boundary conditions. So instead of relying on these problematic boundary conditions from global models, we just solve the problem. And if you notice that a lot of the hydraulic structures end up showing up in the mesh. You can see the jetties here that are finely resolved. You can see fine channels and the effects of dredging up through these channels. Now, the mesh resolution here is really, is really kind of multi-scaled. Near the, the jetties, the mesh resolution is on the order of 10 meters, but out here uh, off the coast, it's a kilometer. So we're really going across a number of scales here. Um, 
Now, the model that I use is called SELF, and SELF's an acronym for uh, some of the numerical methods that we use. But SELF is basically a RANDS model. We use uh, hydrostatic and Bluzinesque assumptions, and we also solve for the temperature and salinity, which are critical for baroclinic circulation on the coast and inside of the estuary. Now, just a bit about some of the spatial discretization. So you, as you may, you may have noticed from the previous slide, we have an unstructured grid in the horizontal. We use low order methods uh, because we want the, the model was, was built uh, to get a fast solution. So in this class of models, we are more than twice as fast as, as other models, and that's because we use low order elements here. So we use P1 for elevation and velocity, and we use uh, finite volume for vertical velocity and tracers. The time scheme we use is an implicit 2D mode for the free surface that allows us to take much longer time steps than other competitive um, models, and we use a semi-Lagrangian method for the advection of momentum. Now, what I'm showing here is just uh, a, a cutout from the inundation of a dry region of the estuary. So you have a wave coming in, and it's uh, wetting part of this dry part of the land. So th this wetting and drying is a critical feature of the model because much of the estuary that we study is subject to these intertidal forcings. As the tide comes in, it gets wet, and then the tide goes out, and then some parts of the estuary dry. And notice that our vertical mesh in this domain, it moves with time. So uh, it expands and compresses depending on the wave. And so we have a vertically varying mesh in time, but the horizontal grid is static. Now, briefly, just to go over the, the governing equations, but I'm not going to spend much time on them, just to give you a sense of the order in which they're solved uh, and, and how we do it, is we have a, a 2D continuity equation. So this is depth integrated, and this is kind of coupled with the 3D momentum equation. Now, it's a semi-implicit scheme, but we have a lot, some of the explicit terms compactly represented here with this bold F, and that includes Coriolis, atmospheric pressure, earth tidal potential, uh, baroclinic gradient, as well as horizontal viscosity. Uh, we have a turbulence closure model here that's 1D, so it's a vertical turbulence closure model. Uh, it's commonly used in ocean studies. And in this particular formulation, we're able to recover common models such as K-epsilon, K-omega, and Canthoclasin uh, for stability functions. And finally, we use uh, 3D transport. Um, passive uh, tracers can also be used, as well as coupled models use this transport formulation. Now, SELF was built, as I mentioned, in the name of efficiency. So that's why we use low order methods. Um, but I still ran into problems with the efficiency and strong scaling when I first started working on this and when I first started uh, the fellowship. So I organized my practicum to work on some strong scaling of the model and the computational efficiency. So I went to go work with Jed Brown from the Petsy Group at Argonne, and we worked on just that. So some of the optimizations that I made were to replace the native 2D solve for elevations, and I replaced it with Petsy. And that allowed us to easily swap out preconditioners um, that scale much better than what we had, what we had previously. So, that allowed us, so previously, if you notice, so here's the old version here in red and the new version. The old version wouldn't scale past 256 no matter what, regardless of the size of the domain. So once I replaced Petsy, the native solver with the Petsy, uh, we were able to scale out. And uh, just kind of a heads up for this uh, graph, uh, at 1024, you're kind of at the limits of domain uh, decomposition, so you, you literally can't scale much higher than that. Some other optimizations I did is I optimized I.O. Um, in particular, introducing some savvy uh, caching of boundary conditions, which really sped up calculations, completely rewrote the transportation um, algorithms, and generally improved memory locality and vectorization, um, all of which I learned uh, at Argonne and through training at conferences such as supercomputing that were paid for by the practicum. So thanks, CSGF. Um, so, the real, so you can see that it scales much better, right? It's, not, uh, it's sublinear over here. Um, but the real payoff is in the, the time to solution. So here's longer uh, performance results. So the old version's in black and the newer version here in red. And you can see using, for production runs, we typically use 128 cores on, on either like Edison or Cori or, or Stampede. And with the new version, we got, we're basically twice as fast if we use the same number of cores. But because we can scale, we can get up to six times as fast as, which frequently happens when your advisor saying, we need these results yesterday, so get, give them to me right now. Well, then you're like, fine, I'll use this many cores and we'll get a much faster solution, right? Um, now, if we look at this other test case, 
where I'm using 128 test cores again, but instead of just running hydrodynamics, I include four tracers, we see that the speed up is even better. So we're up to four times faster, and that's because of the way I rewrote the transportation cal uh, calculation. So a lot more vectorization and improved memory locality and hoisting calculations out of loops um, really pays off. Um, so use VTune or whatever profiling tools you have at your disposal, they really work well. So the reason I use four tracers in that, in that uh, benchmark here is because that's exactly what I use for my studies. So I, I'm doing sediment modeling, and so self provides the hydrodynamic core, which, so it transports sediment and calculates circulation, and then my sediment model is handled over here, which includes four tracers. So the, in this model, there's suspended sediments, which include uh, settling and erosion, bed load transport, so just sediment that can't quite get eroded and uplifted into the uh, water column, and the suspended sediment and bed load interact with the bed to change the bathymetry. So the bathymetry get, um, gets eroded away or there's deposition and it goes up. So after each time step, the sediment concentrations are updated, the bathymetry is updated, and it's fed back to self, which then takes the next hydrodynamic time step. Now, one of the things that were, um, so one of the products that were enabled through the optimization of the code and the, uh, and the sediment model was sediment forecast models, which have a, a number of uses. So first of all, we, we developed a predict, uh, production sediment forecast. So this, this plot here is just showing some animation of, of sediment in the estuary for yesterday, today, and into tomorrow. And what we use this for um, is to assess model skill. So we use observations from the Saturn Observatory, and we could automatically assess model skill and change parameterizations as, we, uh, as need be. Um, but really, where it pays off is during research cruises. So you're out in a boat in the middle of the estuary of the ocean, and you're trying to capture some transient features that you can't see because you're on top of the water. But somewhere underneath, there's some interesting stuff going on that you want to capture. So the way we can do this is that some goofball that kind of looks like me has access to the models, and he can communicate with the chief scientists and folks uh, deploying the sensors, and they can put the instrumentation in the water exactly when they need to to capture these transient features. So what this ends up doing is you're really maximizing the ship time that you have, which is expensive and, and pretty rare. So you're really um, using the, the high-performance computers and the forecast, we're able to get more science while we're out in the field. Now, not only do we run uh, high, uh, forecast simulations, we run hindcasts, and we have to run hindcasts for the entire year. And the reason that is, is because the Columbia River is dominated by river discharge and, and tides, and the river discharge has a strong seasonal component. So here I'm showing river discharge and tidal range over the course of a year in 2012, and you can see that the, the estuary is moving all over the place in, in terms of these. Now, the, the river discharge changes basically due to snow melt and rain in the system, and the tides vary over a roughly 14-day period due to the lunar month. Um, so to characterize the system over the, an entire year, we have, to, we have to run the simulation for this entire thing. And just to give you a heads up, we're, we're basically taking a 36-second time step. So we do year-long or decadal simulations at 36 seconds. So it could take quite a bit of time. Um, but we also uh, map those forcings into non-dimensional <laughs> physical numbers that describe how the estuary dynamics change in terms of stratification and mixing and we can then describe the dynamics in terms of what are called estuarine regimes. So the Columbia falls into four different regimes as it migrates through parameter space and forcings over time. So we need to capture and describe how the sediment dynamics and circulation vary according to these different regimes. So we need to simulate for a long period of time. So what do sediment dynamics actually look like in this system? So on the left, I'm showing some an animation, a uh, plan view of depth integrated suspended sediment in the estuary. Over here, I'm showing a transect along this white line, so it's a slice through the estuary, so this is the water depth here, and this is the distance along uh, that, that transect. And I'm showing how the suspended sediments react over tidal cycles. So as you can see, um, based on the tides, when the tide's coming in, you see the suspended sediment getting pushed upstream, and ebb tide, it gets pushed out. And it gets pushed in, and it gets pushed out. 
right? So these black lines here are salinity. So basically over here on the left, you have dense salt water being evicted into the estuary and then on ebbing, the dense salt water is pushed out. So if we study these over the course of a, of a year or multiple years, as, as we frequently do, we can come up with some generalizations to describe how sediment dynamics operate in this system. So if I calculate the sediment flux, just very similarly to the animation I was just showing, what we do is we, we can expose the sediment pathways and we can quantify how important these, these different pathways are for the estuary. And what that allows us to do is show and improve upon previous models that really described sediment fluxes only coming through the main channels. And what these animations, not, well not just the animations, but the simulations show are that these main channels are actually directly related to these intertidal shoals and lateral bays that are very difficult to observe and measure. And so we couldn't actually, we, they're too sh shallow to send boats into. And so the only way we can capture these kind of intricate details is through a simulation. Um, interestingly, w these pathways are invariant across different time scales, which was surprising to a lot of the people who had studied the system for a long time. So again, this is an insight that you could only get from simulation. And finally, one of the most important findings was we came up with a new conceptual model for sediment dynamics in the system. And we found that the sediment dynamics for the system are like the sediment pathways, more or less invariant across those estuarine regimes that I showed. So roughly just to kind of sketch a picture of, of what happens, and maybe you could have inferred this from these animations. At high water, the, the velocities, they kind of slow down. So you get to high water, the, Things slow down, mixing slows down, and suspended sediment basically settles down. And so you get less suspended sediment in the water column. And during the next ebb tide, when the water is headed back out, you get a lot of erosion from the sediment that had just been suspended, and it evects up into the water column and downstream towards the mouth of the river. So the sediment continues downstream towards the mouth of the river, and then it reaches low tide, and the sediment settles down into the bed once more. Then as flood tide comes in, the sediment is, evacted, is eroded and evacted back up upstream, and so you get this cycle of sediment being eroded and settled and eroded and settled and eroded and settled over and over again. Uh, so you, uh, just like I showed in this animation here. So this simple model was actually is uh, quite a surprise to people because they thought uh, there, there's been a lot of time series analysis on these uh, on these sedimentary features and um, a lot of complicated analysis. But using results from these models and these long-term uh, long uh, observations from the Saturn Observatory, we can see that there's actually just a simple model happening here over time. So in summary, thanks to CSGF and my practicum, we're able to optimize self and get improved efficiency and strong scaling. Because of this, we're able to develop a sediment forecast model in high resolution that wasn't capable before. We're able to guide observations using these forecast models, and we're able to do long-term simulations in higher resolution that were, than was previously possible. And some of the science this has been, that has been facilitated by this includes uh, describing and quantifying the sediment pathways through the system and coming up with a new unifying conceptual model of sediment dynamics in the estuary. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, CSGF for everything they've done. I'd like to thank NURSE for access to the computers and NSF for access to the ship time. And I'd like to thank all the folks who have been uh, advisors and collaborators uh, in this project. And with that, I'll take questions.